Today, we explore light and perception. We poke a hole into another world, a world transformed, a world inverted, a world where up is down and three dimensions become two. Today, we venture into the real upside down. Now, I made a camera obscura that covers up a whole room. You can make a portable camera obscura with the supplies you see here. This is what it would look like once it's all finished. So we got tape in all the places where it could possibly let in light so that the only places that are able to let in light are the viewing hole and the aperture. So what exactly is happening here? To get a little more insight into this, we're going to use a ray diagram. A ray diagram is used often in optics to track where light ends up after going through a lens or some sort of aperture. On this left hand side, we have our object, our outside 3D world. On the right side, we have our projected image image we see inside of the darkroom. Now let's explore the light that we see that comes from the top of this pine tree. Now typically light that is reflected off an object is reflected in all directions, which is why you would be able to see this pine tree anywhere in the 3D outside world as long as you had a clear sight line to the top of the pine tree. But What's special about this situation is that we are only seeing the light that passes through the aperture when we're inside the darkroom, meaning that we're not seeing any of these rays that are radiating in all direction. We are only seeing the rays that happen to pass through the aperture and end up on our screen. We're not seeing any of these and to be more clear as to why, we can see that if we traced a ray in another direction, it would never pass through the aperture. This would never pass through the aperture. This would never pass through the aperture. It is only the rays that follow this very specific path that are gonna be seen on the other side of that. And once they pass through it, they will end up hitting our projection screen. And since they travel in a straight line, the light rays that were once high up above that pine tree will end up at the bottom of our projection screen. And we can use this same kind of analysis for any of these other points. This is why we see a completely inverted world inside of our darkroom. Now this phenomenon should look familiar, pun definitely intended, because this is exactly how our eyes work. Click the link above for a quick explanation on how the geometry of sight is almost identical to this camera obscura system we've set up. Another reason why I love this experiment, aside from it just looking super cool, is that it introduces us to some really interesting math concepts. Let me bring something to your attention here. So let's say we are looking at these two points, a point on this chimney and a point here at the top of this tree. Let's say this aperture is our origin and it has coordinates of 0, 0, 0. And we're using a rectangular coordinate system with an x-axis giving us some horizontal distance from the aperture, a y-axis giving us some vertical distance from the aperture, and a z-axis going out of our screen and into our screen giving us depth from the aperture, we would describe this point here as some value of x, some value of y, and some value of z. 
And this point here right beneath, we can see that they're almost lined up horizontally and vertically. So we'll give it the same value of x. We'll say that this is the same value of y. But it's going to have some other z value. We'll call that z2. Now remember that what we see here on the right, our projected image, is all happening on a sheet that I've hung on my wall. Meaning that it's all flat. There is no depth here. In contrast, we know that the image on the left, we know that the leaves from the tree are not the same distance in depth, not the same z distance as the point on the chimney. However, when we bring it to the projected image on the right, it's all on the same flat plane. And we call this the image plane. And what's peculiar about this is that our three dimensions become two. Now, this is the concept of perspective projection that we're going to keep exploring further. To do this, I cut an arrow out of cardstock and measure its dimensions. And we see, as we put these two images next to each other, that once the image of the real arrow in the real 3D world is projected inside of our camera obscura through our aperture, the image of the arrow is flipped. And once that happens, I'm going to also take the dimensions of this projected image. So here again, I've drawn diagram of our real objects on the left and our projected image on the right the aperture right in between. Now I've adjusted the images to give us a straight line between the points of the arrows, but that won't change our mathematical analysis. Now I'm going to start annotating this. This x here is going to represent the width of our arrow, and this y is going to represent the height of the arrow. Now for the image inside, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to use different coordinates since the image is inverted so for the height of the inverted image i'm going to use y prime to signify that we've transformed the original to something new and for the width for the same reason i'm going to use x prime now as i said before i have taken the measurements of both the real arrow on the outside and the projected image on the image plane so my real arrow had a width of 42 centimeters and my real arrow had a height of 71 centimeters. Once I measured the projection, it had a width of 13 centimeters and it had a height of 22 centimeters. If I divide x, the original width by the projected width, I get 3.23. If I do the same with the heights, y divided by y prime, I get a ratio of 3.22. Now there's a slight difference here, but they are so, so very close. And what this is telling us actually is that we have similar triangles. The triangle made by x, y, and this coordinate z, which remember is our depth, similar to the triangle made by x prime, y prime, instead of calling this z prime, I'm going to call this f. And it's called f because in optics we use this measure called the focal length, which in this case is the distance from the aperture, the place where our light rays converge, to the image plane. And now it gets really interesting. Given that we have similar triangles on the outside in our 3D world, and on the inside of our camera obscura, we can start setting up some proportions that are gonna help us understand the system a little bit better. Given what I've just shown you, we know that x divided by x prime is equal to y divided by y prime. And given the properties of similar triangles, we know for a fact that this must also be true. Z divided by f must be equal to x divided by x prime. Using the second of these relationships, I'm going to go ahead and solve for our x prime in terms of everything else in that equation. My equation becomes x prime equal to 
F X over C. And similarly, we can do the same procedure with Y and Y prime to find Y prime in terms of everything else in the equation. And to make it a little more obvious, I'm going to write x prime equal to f divided by z times x. And I'm going to write y prime as y prime equal to f divided by z times y. And what this is telling us by setting up our equation this way is that if we change the focal distance or if we change the z, we can change the size of that projected image x prime and our y prime are being scaled by this proportion of f divided by z. If we change f by increasing it, that would increase the size of our projected image. Similarly, if we decrease the size of our focal length, if we bring the screen closer and closer to the aperture, that would have an effect of decreasing the dimensions of our projected image. Now let's explore what happens if we change z, the distance of the real image to the aperture. By increasing this denominator, all of this would become a smaller number. Similarly, all of this would become a smaller number, which would mean our projected image would also shrink. Now let's explore what would happen if we keep the focal length constant. I'm going to again rewrite that equation in a slightly different way call x prime equal to f times x over z. And I'm going to say that y prime is now equal to f times y over z. What I'm trying to show you here is that if we keep f constant, we can still manipulate the value of x prime and y prime by either changing the physical dimensions of the arrow, the size, or the depth coordinate z. That means that different sizes, x, y of an arrow, and different distances from the aperture of that arrow can give us the same projected image. Now, what this is telling us mathematically is that this transformation that we have, this perspective projection, is taking a three-dimensional world that lives in the domain we call R3, meaning that there are three dimensions, to a world where there are two dimensions, a flat world that lives on this image plane. And the fact that we can get different arrows to give us the same image tells us that this transformation that's happening here has no unique inverse. Now, what does that mean? In mathematics, when we talk about an inverse of a transformation, it tells us can we or can't we go in the opposite direction of that transformation? And in this case, it's asking us if we see a projected image of an arrow, can we know the precise physical dimensions of that arrow? And can we know the precise z distance of the arrow to the aperture? Meaning, if we have that 2D image, can we recover all three of the dimensions of the original object in the real 3D world? And the answer, of course, is no. Only knowing that projected arrow inside of our screen, we cannot know what size arrow and what distance that arrow was from the screen. So this transformation has no unique inverse because that information is lost. And many different configurations of arrow sizes and distance z can give us the same image. Though this is true to connect it back to our own perception of this world, we do a pretty good job at approximating and we don't have to go through this complex analysis to know if something is closer or farther away. This is just another example of how we are doing math every single day without even thinking about it. In the next video of this series, we explore the dual nature of light. What will happen as the aperture of our camera gets smaller and smaller and smaller? What will we see on the other side when light passes through the thinnest of slivers? Like, subscribe, and watch the video linked above
to find out.